Our first speaker today is Henry Lamb, who will speak about global governance and the future of the United States. Good morning. It's an awfully good crowd for so early in the day. Many of you may remember when George Bush 41 delivered his uh, State of the Union message, he made a reference to the New World Order. Uh, many of my conservative friends were very disappointed to hear that and jumped to conclusions that Mr. Bush was a globalist, had joined the crowd, but something happened on the other side of the world that we didn't know about. Someone else heard that statement. Mr. Willie Bront heard it, and it scared him to death. And he called a meeting of the world socialist leaders in Stockholm, Sweden. They came together, and the socialist international press reported the meeting to be a shot across the bow of Mr. Bush's New World Order. At that meeting, the World Socialists adopted 29 principles and recommendations, the last of which called for the creation of the Commission on Global Governance. Mr. Bront and his friends went to Boutrous Boutrous Ghali, Secretary General of the UN at the time, secured his blessing and significant funding and the Commission convened in 1993 and worked for two years to figure out how the world really ought to be governed. And in 1995, they published their final report. It's called Our Global Neighborhood. If you have not read it, you must. Our Global Neighborhood, published by Oxford University Press. You can find it on our website, and that pauses for you to get your pen so you can write down freedom.org. That's our website. Freedom.org. Explore all the sites you find there. You will find our global neighborhood on the Sovereignty International site. You will also find an analysis of that book if you can't read 410 pages of the details, you can read the analysis. But you must become familiar with Our Global Neighborhood. Because in it, the book puts aside all of the conspiracy theories that you've heard all of your life. It publishes right out for God and everybody to see precisely what the plan is to achieve world government. But early in the book, it describes global governance as the goal and says that our goal of global governance is not world government. Now, I want you to understand what the difference is between global governance and world government. It is precisely the same as the difference between rape and date rape. One begins with seduction, they both end in violence. The Commission on Global Governance seeks to create a world government, regardless of what they call it. And this morning I want to talk to you about four areas of global governance, if you will, that the international community is striving to secure in the area of economics, in the area of security, in the area of education, and in the area of land use control. I'll simply identify the first three areas and delve a little more deeply into the area of land use control. And I will strive to save time for some questions and I will end on time, Jane. The Commission on Global Governance has designed a master plan to achieve total control of the global economy. And the way it will work is to consolidate 
all of the global financial institutions into a single administrative department under the auspices of the Secretary General in the United Nations. IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations Development Organization, all under the auspices, the administrative control of the United Nations. To help achieve this particular goal, in the year 2000 at the Millennium Summit, the General Assembly established what's called the High Level Panel on Financing Development and appointed the former president of Mexico as its chair. This group met for two years and in Monterey, Mexico, last spring, they released their final report. When the first draft of that report came out, it called for implementation of the Tobin tax. This is a tax on the exchange of international currency. In order to achieve that, the international financial system must be consolidated. The initial report called for the creation of a global taxing authority, the purpose of which would be to equalize taxation among the nations of the world. The rest of the world sees the United States at an unfair disadvantage as a trading partner because our taxes are so low. And the purpose of the International Trading Authority would be to equalize the tax burden on individual citizens among the nations. <clears throat> George Bush, 43, to his credit, insisted that references to the Global Taxing Authority be removed from that document. The United States delegates insisted that reference to the Tobin tax or the tax on the exchange of foreign currency be removed from that document. And as a result, when the final document was presented, it was a watered down version of the wishes of the international community. But the high level panel on financing development that was supposed to have lasted for two years, present its final report and then dissolve, decided that it would continue its existence for the purpose of continuing to figure out how to achieve the goals that are set forth in our global neighborhood. What that means in political reality is that if we'll just hang on for a few more years, Mr. Bush will be gone and there'll be somebody else up here that'll sign our documents, as have been done so often in the past. <coughs> <coughs> This is what's happening, a part of what's happening to consolidate the financial mechanisms globally to achieve control of the global economy. To say nothing of regulating through the United Nations all international corporations. To regulate business activity all the way down to the local community. This is an area, if you're interested in economics, you need to study because it is happening as we speak. In the area of security, this is an area that is of great concern and should be of great concern to all of us. Because when the United Nations was created in 1945, its purpose was to serve its members who were sovereign nations, to provide services to its members sovereign nations. Its goal was to achieve security globally for its member sovereign nations. Our global neighborhood says it's time for the United Nations to change its mission, to broaden its horizons, and now provide security for people inside sovereign nations. It defines security to be not only freedom from fear of military attack, but freedom from hunger, freedom from the elements to provide shelter. And if you were paying close attention to uh, President Clinton and to uh, Kofi Annan at the Millennium Summit, you heard them say things such as, no longer can national security be used 
as an excuse to prevent international action to preserve the security of people. And we have seen actions where the United Nations has initiated activity inside a nation without the request or permission of that sovereign nation. We have seen the creation of the International Criminal Court, a recommendation of the Commission on Global Governance, an institution unlike any ever known in the world. This is the first document ever adopted, the first international treaty ever adopted that claims to have power and jurisdiction over nations, all nations, whether or not those nations have ratified the treaty. This International Criminal Court is another step toward security for the people of the world as defined by the international community. The area of security as defined by the Commission on Global Governance goes way beyond anything that we've ever considered uh, international security. It goes all the way to the handguns that Americans claim the right to own. The international community, the United Nations in particular, created several years ago an artificial coalition of NGOs called IANZA for the purpose of eliminating individual ownership of small arms. They are currently in nations around the world engaging in projects to collect small arms and destroy them. It is the goal, the explicit goal of the United Nations as stated in our global neighborhood to control the manufacture, sale, and distribution of all munitions. This is how the United Nations seeks to achieve global security, to control every aspect of human life. The third area of international intervention to achieve global governance is education. This is a goal that began many years ago. One month, in fact, after the creation of the United Nations, Julian Huxley signed the document that created UNESCO. And UNESCO has been the, the leading arm to educate the world. And I won't go all the way back to 1921 with the League of Nations and the disappointment of the international community when the United States failed to ratify that document. But there has been a continuing effort to re-educate, particularly the United States, so that we could come to understand the benefits of a global government, of a world socialist society. And the international community has been busy educating, particularly the people in the United States, for a century, so that we will accept that principle of global governance. And man, have they been successful. There are hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom are in our federal government, promoting the idea of universal education. Education that is different from that which I had the opportunity to experience. When I grew up in school, I was taught that I should strive for individual excellence, for individual achievement, for individual responsibility. That's obsolete. That concept is way beyond our current appreciation of the enlightened international community, where we should strive for global conformity, for obedience, for the common good. When you look at our federal curriculum, and the changes that have occurred in our federal educational program since Goals 2000 and Outcome-Based Education, you will see that the other side is winning the education war. That our schools are now teaching 
those principles of communism, those principles of common good. When you play a ball game in an elementary school, you don't keep score anymore. The idea is to get everybody in the team and it doesn't matter whether you're any good or not. This is to condition us to accept without objection the common good instead of human achievement. It's happening in the area of education and we must be concerned about it. But let me move on now to the area of land use control because this is what is affecting us in the United States and will have profound effect on the United States as much or more than any of the other three areas. And this is the area that I and the organizations I represent uh, spend most of our time working on. In the United States, a few hundred years ago, our founders set out on an experimental journey. But the very foundation of that journey was the principle of land ownership. You know the battle, I trust, between the Hobbesian philosophy and the Rousseau mentality that says that people should live under the rule of a benevolent dictator who holds all land and resources in common and determines who shall have access to what land. Which is vitally different from the Lockean view that says uh, ownership falls to the first possessor. And private ownership is the foundation for the pursuit of individual achievement and excellence. And in the United States we gravitated toward that Lockean philosophy. And it is that philosophy and that understanding of private property ownership and the use of those resources that teaches us stewardship that has allowed the United States to develop an economy and prosperity the likes of which the world has never known. And the rest of the world resents it. But it has freed mankind. It has opened our creative intellect. It has allowed us to solve problems that for millennia have been unsolvable. And it promises a future beyond our wildest imaginations if we can only keep our country on that principle of private property ownership. But there are those in this world who think that we are destroying our planet. There are those in this world that think our survival depends upon a managed society. In 1976, a group of those people met in Vancouver, British Columbia. It was called the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements. Habitat One. Representing the United States was one William K. Riley, who became known as Bill Riley, Chief of the Environmental Protection uh, Administration at one time, or EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Also, representing the United States was one Carla Hill, who became the Chief Trade Negotiator responsible for the Uruguay round, out of which came the World Trade Organization. For the very first time in history, the United Nations set forth in writing its policy on land and land use. You can read an analysis of that 65-page segment of the agenda at our website, and I urge you to look it up. But I'll share with you just a couple of sentences from the preamble to give you an idea of the flavor of that document. It says land cannot be considered as an ordinary uh, asset subject to the inefficiencies of the marketplace. 
This private ownership of land is a cause for the accumulation of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. And the United States signed on to that document. And you may remember back in the 70s, while this hoopla was going on in Vancouver, British Columbia, there was a movement afoot in the United States to uh, build, in fact, to create a comprehensive federal land use planning act. Some of you remember. Some of you remember the Sagebrush Rebellion that arose to ultimately defeat both of those initiatives at federal land use planning. But the proponents of that philosophy didn't quit just because they were defeated. They chose another route. And for the last 30 years, we have been experiencing the implementation of federal land use planning and federal land use control. But the international community was a little more brazen. They set out through a number of initiatives to formalize and codify international control of land use. In 1979, UNESCO and the State Department entered into a memorandum of agreement to participate in the Man and the Biosphere program and created within the bowels of the State Department and I use that term advisedly, was created a program called the Man and the Biosphere Program. And over the next 10 years, there were created in the United States 47 biosphere reserves, United Nations biosphere reserves. UNESCO designated 47 biosphere reserves in the United States. A part of the 411 biosphere reserves that have been designated around the world. Now back during the 70s, there was a guy named Dave Foreman working for the Wilderness Society as a lobbyist. Hold up your hand if the name Dave Foreman means anything to you. Very good. Those of you who didn't raise your hand will have to stay after school. You need to become familiar with this gentleman. He wrote a book in 1990 called uh, uh, Confessions of an Eco Warrior. He was a co founder of Earth First, he's a convicted eco terrorist. And as a part of his plea bargain uh, arrangement, he left Earth First to create a new organization called the Cenozoic Society, which publishes a magazine called Wild Earth. And in 1992, it published the Wildlands Project. Hold up your hand if you are familiar with the Wildlands Project. Okay, that's good, but for the rest of you, I want to take you a little bit deeper into the Wildlands Project. In his book, Dave Foreman, in 1990, Dave Foreman says, I have a vision of wilderness where grizzly bears and wolves can roam from Mexico to Canada without having to cross a highway. Okay, that's not a bad vision if, you know, you've been on drugs. I laughed when I read it. And then in 1992, when Wild Earth was published, the vision gained a little credibility when it was put in the language of Dr. Reed Noss, a biologist from the University of Florida and other universities, who wrote The Wildlands Project in academic language, which said that we may be able to save the planet 
if at least half of the land area of the lower 48 states is converted to wilderness. Out of bounds to human beings. Providing that most of the rest of the land is managed for conservation objectives. Now think about that just for a little bit. Half the land area out of bounds or off limits to human beings. Most of the rest of the land managed by government for conservation objectives. The wilderness areas surrounded by buffer zones that are connected by corridors of wilderness. Even in 1992, although it was getting a, a little more academic, thought it was still kind of hilarious, didn't pay an awful lot of attention to it, until the Sierra Club published in 1994 its vision of the United States in which there were no longer 50 states, but 20 eco-regions. I saw this thing beginning to get a little out of hand. Then comes the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1992. Actually, it arrived at the U.S. Senate in 1994. George Bush won, or 41, refused to sign the Convention on Biological Diversity, although he did sign the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it was ratified rather quickly. The Convention on Biological Diversity was not signed by Mr. Bush, but never mind, Mr. Gore, through his surrogate, Bill Clinton, did sign the Convention on Biodiversity and assumed that it would be ratified. So you remember when he set out to reinvent government? What that really meant as far as land use and resource management agencies was to restructure in order to implement the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we created a whole new policy in the federal government called ecosystem management. And for the very first time, the protection of ecosystems achieved the same priority as the protection of human health, as is set forth in the internal working documents of the EPA. For the very first time, the internal working documents of the Department of Interior said that human beings will be considered as a biological resource in ecosystem management. Now that should really boil your water. I think most of us consider ourselves to be a little more than a biological resource. But our federal government doesn't. This is in print. And in the Clinton era, our entire resource management agencies of the federal government shifted to implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity. Never mind that the Senate refused to ratify it. <clears throat> the Convention on Biological Diversity is an 18-page, very easy to read, uh, UN speak kind of document that you can read it and maybe stay awake to the end of page 18. Really doesn't mean a whole lot. For example, in Article 2 it says, every nation shall create a system of protected areas. Well, when I read that in the treaty, it didn't concern me at all because the United States has a massive system of protected areas. National parks and wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, we had plenty. But the instruction book for implementing the 18-page treaty is 1140 pages. It's called the Global Biodiversity Assessment. And on page 993 of this massive document, it says, the Wildlands Project, published in the United States in 1992, is the central focus of the implementation of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, when I saw that in the United Nations document, I thought, 
there's got to be something going on here. And there really is. Because of the United States, our agencies of federal government and state government are implementing the Wildlands Project just as quickly as we possibly can. Now, if we're going to drive people off the land to achieve this 50% wilderness and drive people off the land to achieve these government-managed buffer zones, where are they going to go? Have you heard of sustainable communities? Sustainable development, sustainable communities is the other side of the Wildlands Project. If you don't know about sustainable communities, please go to our website and read about them. The Department of Housing and Urban Development prepared for Habitat 2 in 1996 in Istanbul the agenda for sustainability that describes in considerable detail what the communities of the future will look like. And very briefly, if you like the idea of Cabrini Green in Chicago, which is this massive housing project for people to go in and sell drugs, then you're going to love sustainable communities. Because sustainable communities has this vision of putting people into public-private partnership housing. Now, the way that is designed to work, or at least envisioned to work, is the federal government will offer a grant to an NGO to build a housing project to meet the government specifications, to manage that housing project, to assure that there is equality in terms of eco economic standing, ethnicity, that these housing units are the people who live there are within walking distance of their workplaces so that you don't have to have automobiles in these sustainable communities. That transportation will be essentially by light rail managed by a public-private partnership. You begin to see this vision of a globally managed society. And I read a book in 1992 that said something to the effect that the central organizing principle of society has to be environmental protection. In that same book, it said the internal combustion engine should be totally abolished in 25 years. Fortunately, that guy wasn't elected president, the author of that book. But that is the philosophy that is prevailing out there in our public policy. And it's happening much faster than any of us uh, even begin to imagine. And we haven't realized uh, the effect. We have seen little evidences here, there, and yon. And we've gotten concerned about it. You may have seen in the newspaper not long ago that the farmers in Klamath Basin at the Oregon-California border had their water turned off because environmental organizations had convinced the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Interior that the sucker fish was endangered. Now that sucker fish has been endangered for a long time. Because when the Indians found them, they beat them over the head and stuck them under a stalk of corn. Because that's trash fish. And whenever somebody snagged a sucker fish on a fishing pole, you sure didn't throw it back in. <laughs> you got rid of it. It was endangered. It has been endangered ever since man has discovered it. But nevertheless, it was used as an excuse to implement the Endangered Species Act and thereby acquire the authority to turn off the irrigation water that actually belonged to the farmers who were promised irrigation water in perpetuity. But nevertheless, the ESA, the Endangered Species Act, took priority and those farmers were nearly put out of business. Why? To get them off 
the land that was drawn on a map to be a buffer zone around a wilderness area. We see it in California. We saw it in Missouri with the nomination of the Ozark Biosphere Reserve. We see it in Florida with the Everglades Restoration Plan. We see it in the Bay of Fundy in the main Canada border. We see it in the Yukon to Yellowstone, the Y to Y project in Cascadia. We see it in the Southern California Wilderness Area. We see it in Barbara Boxer's Wilderness Plan. We are converting this country to wilderness. But what you hear about is urban sprawl. And we've got to put a growth boundary around our urban communities. What our real problem is, is wilderness sprawl. Back in 1964, when the first Wilderness Act was adopted, Hubert Humphrey stood on the Senate floor and he said, this legislation will provide nine million acres of pristine wilderness so our posterity can see <coughs> what our forefathers had to conquer. That was the purpose of the Wilderness Act, at least in the minds of the Congress in 1964. But it was not the purpose of the Wilderness Society who had nurtured that bill through Congress. It was the opening of the door. And since 1964, we have converted well over 200 million acres of wilderness and every single year there are new bills in Congress for more wilderness states are now buying up land to convert to wilderness to convert to buffer zones in the name of protecting the environment protecting the sucker fish protecting the spotted owl which never did need protecting protecting the yellow-bellied, red-legged, liver-lipped frog in the middle of Arizona. <clears throat> it's an excuse to control land and land use. More than 40% of the land area in the United States is already owned, owned by government. Virtually every square inch of the remaining land is potentially controlled by government. You know what a wetland is? Who was it that told the story? I guess it was in a private discussion last night during the reception. Somebody told the story about some guy that was driving through... Uh, I think it was Shoney National Forest in, in Illinois. He couldn't make it to the next rest. Grunting and he was crossing his legs and he had to stop and he got out and, and he felt a whole lot better when the wildlife officer came up and charged him with, uh, with doing what he shouldn't be doing inside of a national forest. If there's federal land, he made a wetland on the long side of the road. It is amazing. We have allowed our public policy to get to the point where the federal government through its agencies can come into private property and say, this is a wetland, whether it is or not. And then the burden of proof falls on the landowner to prove that it is not a wetland. And guess who ultimately makes the decision? The Corps of Engineers or the Fish and Wildlife Service or the agency that made the declaration in the first place. That's got the, the cart before the horse. Uh, you put the burden of proof to prove a negative. That, you know, that's wrong, people. But this is a part of the policy that is transforming our America into a nation that fits in 
this global society. I don't want to sound like a fatalist, because I'm not. I'm absolutely convinced that ultimately the principles of freedom shall prevail. I know that that will happen. I may not live to see it. I won't live to see it. But truth cannot be extinguished. And our great society promotes the discovery of truth, not the suppression of it. And those of you who are involved in the climate change issue know that it is the goal of the international community, those who believe in the Russo-Socialist philosophy of governance, it is their chief objective to suppress truth in order for the propaganda to prevail that supports their power. That's not the American way. And a part of the reason I am encouraged is because a number of years ago, beginning with those people who initiated the Sagebrush Rebellion, it is the people of America that won't sit idly by and accept what is happening. That same spirit of rebellion that created this nation in the first place has never died. It continues. <laughs> but those of us who, who believe in this philosophy are busy about our individual pursuit of happiness and allow government to do its thing until government goes beyond its boundaries. And when government goes beyond its boundaries, that rebel spirit within us arises and we do whatever is necessary to straighten government out. And we made a big step forward at the last presidential election. But it's only a beginning. We have a lot more work to do. But just as we suppressed and stopped this Federal Land Management Act in the 70s and are beginning to stir and arouse a nation to change the Endangered Species Act. The water is flowing in Klamath Basin again. Organizations are springing up all over this country and we are beginning to work together. Four years ago, we were a part of the creation of what's called the Freedom 21 campaign. This is a group of organizations of ordinary people who come together to say that perhaps the most important thing that we can do in our lifetime is to advance the principles of freedom in the 21st century in public policy, in education, and in our own lives. And we have been working to do that. In Florida, which was a high priority state for implementation of the Wildlands Project, who in 1992 published three maps of the state showing Florida how it was in 92, how it would be in 2002, and how it would be when the Wildlands Project is fully implemented. Converting Florida from 10% public ownership and 90% private ownership to 90% public ownership and 10% private ownership. The method of choice there is the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Project or plan. You may have seen news about it where the Everglades was destroyed by the Corps of Engineers 40 years ago when we straightened out rivers and dug canals and, and created thousands of acres of lush farmland and we dried up the Everglades. Now the environmental organizations have been successful in getting Congress to create a plan $7.8 billion to convert the Everglades back to its pre-Columbian condition where alligators and cottonmouth moccasins roam and people no longer are able to farm. There are 52 
individual projects that constitute this Everglades Restoration Plan. And that plan is designed to restore the Everglades to the wilderness as envisioned by Dave Foreman, by Dr. Reed Noss, by the Sierra Club, and by those who want to convert our country back to wilderness. At least 20,000 homeowners, landowners, and farmers will be driven off their land to convert this utopian, uh, to make this utopian vision of wilderness. Well, the people in South Florida are not just going to roll over and play dead. They have come together and very recently created what they call the Sawgrass Rebellion. And organizations all over this country are joining with them to stand, to say, enough is enough. This is a land of the free, not a land to be governed by a collective advised by environmental extremists to achieve a pre-Columbian vision of wilderness? I believe that we are making some progress. I believe that we are getting the attention of some of the people in Congress. I believe that ultimately the land of the free shall remain the land of the free and not the land of the manipulated. But we still have a great deal of work to do. And the way it will, the way it will work and be successful is if we realize that the challenges that we face regardless of our area of concern is a part of this massive plan to achieve global governance based on a philosophy of centralized management, call it global governance or world government. But if you realize that this is the philosophy that is permeating our public policy in almost every arena, then we can work together to advance the principles of freedom which shall prevail if we do not <clears throat> we could very well endure a generation or more of continued oppression before that spark of freedom and rebellion arises again I invite you to join with those organizations that stand in support of the people in South Florida, of the people in Klamath Basin, of the people in the Bay of Fundy, the people in Indiana, the people in every community who, who are being converted to a sustainable community, and recognize that it is the principles of freedom that are being, uh, that are being tread upon, and that we must stand together. And if we do, there's no question about it, we shall prevail. I want my children, my grandchildren, and their children's children to live in the land of the free, to be able to achieve the maximum of their God-given potential, to not be governed by a collective, a Soviet, or a government. We must remain, maintain, sustain that principle of government empowered by the consent of the governed. If we relinquish that right, we will be squashed by our government. Now we have 14 minutes for questions. If you have one, please come to the mic. <coughs> <coughs> Yes, sir. Alter the increasing dictation by local planning commissions, school boards, 
and others now creating this dictatorship? I think the only solution is to see that land use decisions remain in the hands of local elected officials. More and more and more we are seeing land use decisions delegated to appointed commissions, especially regional commissions. Once that happens, we no longer have any accountability. And I, I think the answer lies in local elected officials. At least if they vote to do this sort of thing, we can unelect them, but we can never unelect the appointed bureaucrats. Hi, I'm Andy Schlafly. I was wondering, Mr. Lamb, if you could comment on this issue of biological diversity, which has been drilled into everybody's head for the past couple of decades and is taught in the schools. But recently, we've been seeing instances where biological diversity is not good, where people have been importing species from other countries and bringing them into the United States. And we're now getting a lot of alarm bells that it's not good to have species from other regions of the world come into our country. For example, the snakehead fish was introduced into Maryland, and we're getting all this alarm that they have to kill the snakehead fish in Maryland because diversity is not good. I was wondering if you could address that. Yes. Uh, the in issue of invasive species has become quite a hot issue. And if you live in Georgia or anywhere in the southeast and know what kudzu is, you understand why. But the, the example you use is great as well. But I don't think you can throw out the baby with the bathwater. You can't say that all non-native species are bad. It's simply a matter of management and intelligent selection and in intelligent use. In my view, many, many of our best products come from non-native species. For example, I would hate to have to do without uh, Hampshire pigs. They make the very best pork chops I've ever had in Tennessee but they are non-native species. So in my view, the answer is intelligent selection and use of resources. Mr. Lamb, uh, I'm Norm Wilson from Los Alamos. I'm a retired nuclear engineer. We've seen editorials show up in our local press in the last year and a half or two years by a group called the Writers of the Range. Now, I first thought they must be a grassroots kind of a source of public comment, but I have real suspicions about that group now. And could you comment on what you know about this group? Did you say writers or? R writers. Writers of the, of the range. I'm not familiar with that group. I'm sorry. Well, they showed up about the time the Sagebrush Re Re Rebellion showed up, and it appeared to support them, but the more I read, of the authors of these articles, the more I'm convinced they're supporting this biodiversity whole in a whole effort in a very clandestine way. So uh, find out what it is. I, I, I really will. Know. I will certainly make a point to look into it and, and and find out what I can. But I'm sorry, I just am not familiar with that group. Thank you. My name is Jules Marshall. I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Lamb, um, and I want to mention that I join you with heart and conviction. I believe that truth and freedom shall prevail, but it obviously has something to prevail over. Uh, there, there's a proverb that, that goes, where there is lack of vision, the people are destroyed. And, and I regret that I think the blind uh, majority in our great country may somehow change the motto of our country to, uh, in earth we trust. <laughs> in, in, in this earth first uh, doctrine, so to speak. But I, I, I want to salute you and your vision, in, in, before I ask my question, in, in this respect, uh, the, this, uh, this villain of the Novus Ordo Seclorum, or the New World Disorder, is truly a, a, a worthy adversary to truth and freedom. And my question to you, sir, is uh, what role do you think the, our own Federal Reserve may play in the globalization of this uh, consolidation of financial mechanics throughout the earth? I am not an economist, so I'll put that disclaimer up front. But as my life 
Lord love old most Miss Floyd Lilly, who is the vice chair of Sovereignty International, once said, the Federal Reserve is neither federal nor are there any reserves. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, where there is money to be made by hook or crook, one way or the other, uh, those people who have it are going to make more. The short, short answer is, the Federal Reserve gives every appearance to me of full and total cooperation with the global agenda. Uh, Mr. Lim, I'm Sue Huck, and uh, I have to compliment you on having the really big picture. You've certainly given the best presentation I have ever heard. Uh, I have a little article entitled, A Fly Spec on the Big Picture, <laughs> and that's about what it is. I, I've addressed parts of these subjects uh, in my book out there. But I wanted to uh, point out that there's an aspect you might put onto your net uh, sometime uh, I find that nobody's really thought of this. After they get through rusticating half of the United States, uh, there's a couple of billion people on the other side of the Pacific who might say, look, if you don't want to use it, maybe we do. <laughs> you know, and they may come over and visit us. And <laughs> I don't know whether the people who are planning to, uh, to uh, make a wild land out of this have, have thought that far ahead. Uh, Personally, I think they simply hate us. It's, it's very simple. They like to get us off the land, and they would like to put us on reservations and manage us, that's all. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing, do you have any idea who actually wrote Al Gore's book? You didn't mention that he was the author of those ridiculous remarks. Uh, but, there, are, there are a number of people acknowledged in his book. There are a, a few people who have been uh, major contributors. But uh, Jessica Matthews Tuckman yeah. was one of the primary authors uh, without, uh, without credit. But there are others who contributed as well. Well, Gore in his speeches never, never refers to these things. And I don't really think he's, uh, you know, he's, he, he knows much about the environment. I really don't. Well, that, that could be uh, arguable. Uh, Al Gore is from Tennessee, and by the way, I apologize for that. <laughs> but Al had a political conversion in 1988 that he blames on his son's accident. But my foreman, in the 1980s, I ran a construction company, and my foreman was a lifelong Democrat who served on Mr. Gore's uh, campaign uh, during his first bid for, for election. And uh, I was told firsthand that representatives from three environmental organizations visited Mr. Gore's campaign headquarters and promised him that it would be impossible for him to spend out his campaign fund if he were to follow these plans. And Al Gore had a, an enlightenment, an epiphany. He was converted. Yeah. And he's been that way ever since. Yeah, well now, here's another follow-up in a way when the man's running for president, and he had just reissued that book, which is, I mean, it's, it's yeah. ridiculous if you take it apart, why does not the Republican Party take and wrap it around his head? You know, say, this, this is the kook who wants to eliminate the uh, internal combustion engine. You're going to I, I can't. Him? I can't speak for the Republican Party. We have one more question behind you, and I think we have two minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Margaret Maxey, retired professor, University of Texas. Margaret, would you speak into the mic a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because in private conversations, you've mentioned the old bromide, follow the money. Uh, could you tell this audience what you have been doing through your son, Adam, about discovering the sources of funding? Yes, I surely, people? Margaret, I certainly will. But let me check and make sure that we're on the same Time. I have five more minutes before the hour. Okay. <laughs> it's, all right. What uh, Dr. Maxey is referring to is the Federal Assistance Award Data System. Has anybody here ever heard of that? Why, no. Oh, one person has. Excellent. In 1983, Congress passed a law that said every agency of government that disperses grants and contracts must report those grants and contracts to the American people through the Bureau of Census. 
Since 1983, the Bureau of Census has been putting out a linear text file in sequential order on magnetic tape and say, here public, this is what the government has done. Nobody's ever heard of it. Nobody has ever been able to access it. However, <coughs> I have a son who at the age of 16 was given the privilege of choosing a new car for his 16th birthday or whatever else he wanted of equal value. He chose a computer. This was in the 80s. That kid has devised a program to take that Federal Assistance Awards data, 20 million records, 64 gigabytes of data. And now, if you want to know how much money the government has given to, say, the Nature Conservancy since 1983, you go to that website, anybody who has a, a computer types in The Nature Conservancy and you will sit there and watch it grind for 23 seconds and realize that since between 1996 and 2001, anyway, The Nature Conservancy received 102 grants, no, 521 grants totaling $102 million. And you can do that with any other organization as a result of this computer program. Now, what we're going to do with that is to say to Congress, now that we're able to produce the evidence and say to Congress, for God's sake, quit giving these NGOs our tax money to come back and convert America to wilderness. And you can help with that. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you.